Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Hi, everybody. I am talking about love in the time of corona. And how many people have seen the CDC STD Dear Colleague letter about what to do about STDs during this time? Have people seen that? Just a few of you. Okay, great. Well, then I'm so glad we're talking about this. Anyway, yes, sure, it's about love, but it's really about sex in the time of coronavirus. We're not going to be talking about if coronavirus is an STD. There's a lot of talk about that, just like there was with Zika virus. Is, is this found in semen or vaginal fluid? The answer, to my knowledge, is no, but it has been found in feces, and for a lot of our patients who are MSM, that is a relevant piece of information. What I will say is that we know coronavirus is sexually transmitted because you, for most sex, not all, you have to be within six feet of your partner. And so, so for that reason alone, I'm going to consider it an STD. Other coronaviruses in the past have not been shown to be sexually transmitted, but we, we will not really be addressing that today. So on April 6th, the CDC issued a, a guidance for STD management when clinical services are disrupted. And we will make sure to send that to everybody today. And so what their goals were was to offer a flexible and pragmatic and really a harm reduction approach in these times where we might not be able to do all the things we're used to. And they wanted to minimize the reductions in STD care and treatment. They're not intended to replace the 2015 STD treatment guidelines. They're really only for use when in-person visits are not possible. If someone's in your clinic, then please continue to use the 2015 guidelines. And they do say when you see people in person, and I know you all don't need me to tell you this, but to use appropriate precautions to prevent SARS-CoV-2 transmission between patient and provider. And then if you, in your clinical setting, are unable to provide services for STDs, the um, CDC recommends that we establish relationships with other clinics and pharmacies to be able to provide the treatment. And finally, they recommend that we create a phone or telemedicine-based triage to identify individuals who need in-person evaluation and to determine who is eligible for syndromic management not in person. So. Which patients need in-person visits? Well, the CDC tells us that symptomatic patients should probably be seen in person. I will say, I don't think that we are doing that completely, and our STD clinic here at Seattle King County Public Health is not recommending every symptomatic patient be treated in person, but those are the people that you would prioritize. Anyone who's a known STD contact might be someone you prioritize, but again, a lot of these people can still be seen remotely and managed remotely. I think the people we worry really truly the most about are individuals at risk for complications. So if you have someone who you have concern for PID, if they have vaginal discharge and abdominal pain, if they're pregnant with syphilis, and if they have symptoms concerning for neurosyphilis, that's the group that I'm the most concerned about. And then they say routine screening visits should be deferred until after the emergency kind of status is over. So who are people that are just the best candidates for what we call syndromic management, just based on sort of the syndrome or constellation of symptoms they have? So who are those people that might be best treated without in-person evaluation? And again, you can do telemedicine. I diagnosed someone with secondary syphilis this week by telemedicine. But um, the people that they say would be good people for, in, for syndromic management without in-person evaluation is male urethritis, suspected primary or secondary syphilis, vaginal discharge, and proctitis. And then other considerations for triage, which they don't mention, but I think are really important to consider. Do they have concurrent COVID symptoms? That might not be the person you bring into your office right now, and you try and treat their COVID symptoms, however you would be doing that, and ask them to defer and try and manage their STD at home. Transportation issues. Here at Harborview, we have a lot of patients that might take three different buses and don't have any transportation. That is not someone I want to be coming in for STD treatment. That's not safe for them or for the community. 
Then adherence. We certainly have a lot of patients that struggle with adherence, and some of the treatments we'll talk about require much longer treatments than the one-and-done shot and azithromycin that you might get in the clinic. And then the CDC really urges innovative approaches in terms of home or non-clinic-based testing. And I see Joanne is on this call, and maybe at the end we can talk a little bit about that. I'd be very interested to hear if any of you all are doing any sort of home or non-clinic-based testing. But it sure would be interesting if we had a really good home syphilis test, which my understanding is the point of care test right now, is not really ready for prime time. I was on a CDC call about these guidelines that we're talking about today just last week, and really nobody felt that they were quite ready. But what if people are doing self-testing, um, extra genital screening at home, things like that? There's a lot of opportunities, and while we may not be able to totally implement them during this period of the coronavirus, who knows, it might be a good thing to get us started for thinking about should something like this happen again, or as we've been told, there may be waves of the coronavirus. So if you are having people come in, and we have lots of people who are still coming in, whether we want them to or not, they... They are just still coming in. Definitely consider self-testing. And I've placed these posters. We have these great posters in Spanish and English. They're available. We have them available for free. They're available in Spanish and English. There are male and female or people who have a vagina and people who have rectum and oropharynx. And we think they're great. They're available for free. I know that Amy Radford is sending out the PDFs more than the posters right now, but they are something that can be really helpful, and you can just print them out yourselves. But we, after Corona passes, we're happy to send you however many of these you want. What does the CDC tell us in terms of syndromic management right now? They made a table for preferred and alternative treatments, and again, we will send this all to you. The preferred are consistent with the 2015 STD guidelines, and the alternatives are all oral regimens, and they really looked at pharmacokinetics and pharmodynamics when making these recommendations. And there are some things that you might see that you haven't seen before. One is that the suffixime dose was increased to 800 milligrams rather than 400 milligrams. That's all related to pharmaco pharmacokinetics. Also, Cefpidoxime, which we haven't seen for a couple guidelines, is brought back. You'll see a lot of things that we haven't seen for a couple guidelines, but the dose is given twice, 400 milligrams POQ 12 hours times two, and that's based on expert opinion and apparently some unpublished efficacy study. These are kind of dense, and I'll go through them quickly. You will have all these slides, of course. You will have the letter. For penile discharge or urethritis syndrome, you presumptively are treating for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And so the preferred treatments are really the same as for everybody now in the 2015 guidelines, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, no change. The alternative treatments are suffixime 800 plus azithro or cefpidoxime 400 times 2 plus azithro. If there's a cephalosporin allergy, and they recommend gentamicin plus azithro for in-person and for outpatient or, you know, not in-person, if there's an allergy to cephalosporins or oral cephalosporins are unavailable, they say we can, for the first time again, do azithromycin two grams orally. If azithromycin is not available as, you know, the additional treatment as above uh, and the patient is not pregnant, they do say you can substitute doxy, but they do preferentially say azithro. For vaginal discharge without suspected PID, and if there are symptoms of PID, you, the person needs an in-person evaluation, the preferred in-person treatment is really guided by the exam and lab results. If you're doing this not in person, then if there's a discharge or odor suggestive of BV or trick, more of like a frothy, malodorous discharge, they recommend metronidazole for seven days. And if there's more of itching and a curdy discharge, then fluconazole or topical antifungals. For genital ulcer disease and suspected primary or secondary syphilis, they say again, if there are symptoms of neurosyphilis, do not pass go. They need an in-person evaluation. The preferred treatment in person for just suspected primary or secondary syphilis, the same as always, benzathine penicillin, based on whether it's that that's benzathine penicillin one time. The alternative treatments when in person is not available for men for and I'm sorry, they write this males and non-pregnant females, but I really wish they would start talking about anatomy. 
because I don't think it takes into account our, our patients who are transgender or um, gender non-binary, but I, so I'm sorry when I'm saying this, I'm trying not to, but I'm, I just am writing what they wrote. So in people with a penis and non-pregnant females, doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO twice a day for 14 days, and in pregnant patients, they really say there's just not another option besides for penicillin. The one thing that's different is that they say that anyone who's treated for syphilis with non-benzathine penicillin regimens should have serologic testing done three months after treatment, regardless of HIV status. We've all always been doing that for our HIV patients, but the current guidelines, if a patient doesn't have HIV, is that you don't repeat the RPR until six months after treatment. But here they want us to do three months. Okay, and finally, proctitis. The preferred treatment in person is ceftriaxone plus doxycycline for seven days. So you're treating for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and the doxycycline is preferential because observational data has shown that doxycycline may be better at treating rectal chlamydia than azithromycin. There's a randomized controlled trial that is recently finished enrolling and will eagerly await to find out what that randomized controlled trial says, but that is why the doxycycline is preferred here. If you can't see the person in person, then cefixime plus doxy for seven days or cefpidoxime times two plus doxy for seven days. And then they do say if doxy is not available or the patient is pregnant to use azithromycin one gram PO instead. Interestingly for this one, they didn't talk about what to do if there was cephalosporin or penicillin allergy. I'm going to extrapolate from the previous one, and I started to put it on this slide, but given that they didn't give us exact instructions, I, I didn't feel comfortable putting it down, but I would, I would extrapolate. They also give some recommendations about expedited partner therapy. This was given, just so you know, not in the guidance that I'm going to send you, but after the call we had last week, the California PTC took the information we learned on the call and put this in. So just so you know, it's not totally clear yet from the CDC and their letter, but this is what we heard on the call. So expedited partner therapy for chlamydia is one gram of azithro. And for gonorrhea, whether diagnosed or presumptive, would be cefixime 800 plus azithro or cefpidoxime plus azithro. And if azithro not available and the patient is not pregnant, can use doxy. Note that they did not write what to do for syphilis contacts. Again, they really said if someone is a known syphilis contact, they should probably be prioritized to get treatment in person. Our STD clinic here at Seattle King County Public Health has written guidelines for syphilis, and they said is that for syphilis EPT to do 14 days of doxycycline. But that is, that's off menu, and that's expert opinion. So what about for follow-up? If an alternative oral regimen is used, follow up, tell the patient to follow up with us first by phone in five to seven days if there's been no improvement. Counsel patients to come in for STD and HIV testing when in-person clinical care resumes at the end of this very strange time. They also said, use your public health people to send reminders to these patients to link them to services at this time. What I would just urge people to, set, to do is to try and figure out a way to set up some sort of tracking system for these patients that you treated remotely so that we can keep track of them and make sure we get them in for testing in person and follow-up. Just this week, on April 14th, the FDA reported a shortage of azithromycin, which is probably because there's been a lot of press about azithromycin use in COVID. And so what the CDC told us is to use alternative therapy like doxycycline for chlamydia, gonorrhea as part of dual therapy, non-gonococcal urethritis, cervicitis, and M. genitalium. The FDA predicts more availability in early May, and there is an FDA drug shortage website. Now, other people have been reporting shortages in cefixime, in gentamicin, and so I'll be interested to hear from all of you, and especially our pharmacists, what the CDC says and FDA is that is not a drug shortage nationally. It is sometimes that there are local supply chain issues. I think there's still a lot of murky areas left over. Um, one is they didn't really clarify if suddenly EPT in men who have sex with men is allowed. I think they're, again, being quite liberal in their recommendations right now. So I think 
right now for all of us. My opinion is that I would say right now EPT for MSM, if you do not feel it is safe for people to come into your clinical setting, is probably reasonable right now with very strict instructions to come in for HIV and STD testing, if they are, especially if they're not HIV, known to be living with HIV. So is test of cure recommended for alternative regimens? They really didn't comment on that either. I would not see it as test of cure. I would see it as all of these people need to come in as soon as possible when all of clinical services are resumed to be tested. But they did not specifically say test of cure. And then what do we do for pregnant women with a penicillin allergy or without access to penicillin who have syphilis? Is azithromycin an option until they might be able to get penicillin desensitization? We don't know the answer, and I, do not, I don't have an answer for any of these, but these are the, some of the questions the CDC brought up. I want to remind people about the excellent national STD curriculum put together by a lot of our colleagues, most notably David Spock, who is on this call. And um, it's a fantastic resource for all things STD treatment related. And it's also, I think some of us are using this time to get some free CME, and it's a great source of free CME. I also want to remind people that the STD prevention training centers have a great online clinical consultation service available. We're still getting tons of consultations during this time, COVID and non-COVID related, and so I'll give you that information. And then there are apps to put on your phone, including the STD treatment guidelines and a clinical toolbox for STDs, and instructions are there. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.